I'm Philip Hooker, VP of Strategic Programs at Software AG, co initiator to the open source ThinEdge.io project. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this sixth ThinEdge.io community meetup. We've got a range of presentations and practical demonstrations from the ThinEdge.io team and contributors, which cover what is new in the latest version, how it can be used in extended, and real implementation examples. But before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. We're using Teams webinar for this meetup. So if you hover your cursor over the main window, a control bar will be shown. The control bar allows you to raise your hand if you have a question, show the meeting toolbar, show the meeting chat sidebar, view participants, and leave the webinar. If you have any questions during the session, you can submit them through the chat or raise your hand at the end of each session. The presenters will answer questions at the end of their session, but please feel free to ask questions at any time during the presentation. For those with raised hands, we will unmute your mic so you can actually ask questions directly when called on. We're also keen to use polls to capture your opinion on important topics. These will initially appear as pop-ups, but will also be available in the meeting chat sidebar for later review. And also, if you want to change the size of your screen or go to full screen or change your audio settings, please click the ellipsis three dot symbol in the control bar on the submenu. I'll be introducing the agenda and our first speaker in just a few minutes. But first, I would like to say a few words about the ThinEdge.io community. The ThinEdge.io community is an in-person and online tech enthusiast group who are excited about the practical implementation of ThinEdge.io, the open source cloud agnostic IoT framework designed for resource constrained edge devices. We're an eclectic group of IoT, OT and IT professionals from the core development team, contributors and the open source community all experienced in the use of industry-proven security, connectivity, and software management methods for lightweight deployments. During the sessions, we aim to replicate ThinEdge.io's no-nonsense approach with interactive technology demonstrations so you can learn from both our successes and also challenges. So we're continuously evolving our approach to allow more time for technical deep dives and interactions with the ThinEdge.io team and contributors. We'll kick off with a brief recap of the updates in release 0.8 from the finished IO team. Then we'll immediately move into technical sessions from the finished IO team, which cover managing child devices and also leveraging self-service. We'll then change gears and sort of focus on our co contributor demonstrations, which cover detecting anomalies in Edge ML and also integrating multiple OT protocols. Time allowing, all of these sessions will be followed by a short Q&A. This then rolls into an open guru bar and networking session towards the end. So, Thinedge.io, the Thinedge.io project is progressing at a rapid pace. I would like to introduce, introduce the presenters of our first talk. So Andre Schreiner, uh, Edge Product Manager, and also Ruben Miller, Product Owner, from the Thinedge.io team, who will outline the new features and updates in Thinedge.io that are now available in release 0.8. So Andre, over to you. Right, thank you, Phil. And hi and welcome also from my side. So I'm Andre Schreiner, product manager in the Thinature project. And uh, before I start, I'm also pleased to announce uh, to this community that uh, Ruben Miller has joined us as the product owner for the project. We are very lucky to have him as he has deep expertise in the area of agent development and IoT device management. And now together with Ruben, I will share more uh, about the new things we have added to the 0.8 release, uh, which is already out and give you some a little bit of background information. So now for people who are new to ThinEdge, I always like to start with a short intro on ThinEdge IO, so what it is and why we're developing it. Um, so in very short, ThinEdge is the open source and platform agnostic glue between your OT devices and IoT or cloud platforms. So our initiative is focused on solving the problem of connectivity and device management of resource constrained devices like PLC gateways and uh, industrial uh, equipment. Uh, we are providing ready to use modular components that allow you to, uh, you know, out of the box secure connectivity of devices to IoT platforms and cloud 
comprehensive firmware and software management and monitoring. So this is especially relevant for all the devices and hardware in the operational technology and automation space. So we are able to transform those, you know, very constrained single purpose resource constrained devices um, into, you know, additional deployment options for uh, IoT applications and logic. Now, while technically all of this sounds great, I also wanted to give you uh, some, you know, uh, ideas on how our users are already leveraging or starting to leverage ThinEdge. So we have partners who are using ThinEdge on gateways to increase the, for example, energy efficiency in buildings or in the uh, production systems, which is a very relevant topic at the moment, especially because of the exploding energy prices. So here are, you know, MQTT interfaces, the messaging mechanisms are used to exchange telemetry, telemetry data from, you know, energy meters. Uh, you can, you know, also do things like remote configurations of the gateway itself or protocols um, like Modbus or Mbus, which are used in, in the domain. We also have partners who leverage ThinEdge on uh, devices like PLC gateways or soft PLCs are emerging the uh, type of devices that are coming now. So here ThinEdge acts as the bridge, as the foundation for all types of cloud connectivity, IoT device management functionality. So it's a, it's a, it's a good foundation to build and expand on uh, because it's very lightweight and uh, efficient enough and secure enough to run on devices that are really limited um, in the resources that they have. And also we are getting started uh, uh, in use cases around uh, you know things like wind energy, uh, to be able to monitor things like wind farms or wind turbines, and again, unify the zoo of different protocols and devices that are used uh, in such environments. Now, let me just continue. Uh, last but not least, I also wanted to share, before I hand over to, to Ruben on more details, uh, I wanted to share some highlights from this year on what we have done and where you could find ThinEdge under the hood uh, or on things like conferences. So we have, you know, uh, great partners like Kunbus or Nexus or FM who did a great job supporting and promoting the project. So we had a first representation of ThinEdge uh, uh, based on some partner solutions on the SPS trade fair. We also just uh, recently done a cool uh, hackathon organized by Kunbus. Um, and you can see some some impressions here. So really, Thin Edge becomes people are becoming aware uh, of Thin Edge, and there are also first articles and and communities mentioning it. Um, so we are also getting attention and consideration from big industrial IT consortiums like the Open Industry 4.0 Alliance, and working closely with partners like, for example, Neuron Automation on the next generation of PLC engineering industrial automation. So ThinEdge is, is very uh, broadly used in, in various use cases, and we are very optimistic to continue to grow um, our community, our visibility in the next year, and we would welcome you to, to try it and also help us and join forces with us. So now handing over to Ruben. Thanks, Andre, for the introduction. So my name is Ruben Miller. I'm the new product owner for the Thin Edge. So I'm really excited to be able to join the team. And I'm hoping I can also deliver um, to the success of the team and build upon the very strong basis that we already have um, and bring it forward to make a really great product in the end, which helps solve everyone's uh, use cases. So that being said, I wanted to kind of start off with showing basically what our vision is again. Because also me joining you, I think it's a good time for a bit of a refreshment. So ThinEdge is a framework which delivers kind of like the building blocks to be able to then present or like to solve your kind of problems on your devices to solve your use cases. So what better analogy to use is then Lego, at least that's how we say it in Australia. Um, so you can think of the building blocks that you can kind of assemble them together to build your solution. But then the first kind of instance you might think, wait a second, I mean, how big or small are these building blocks going to be? Because there's also, you need a thousand blocks to build your kind of your solution. That's also not ideal. However, you don't want to be at so big building blocks that you become so inflexible. So when I talk about building blocks that we want to provide by ThinEdge itself, we're talking about kind of like functional building blocks. So if we look at from the device management aspect, for example, so look at the, the software, configuration, firmware, telemetry, 
and stuff like that. And not always looking at the device management aspect, but also like connectivity, looking at the cloud and the reliable communication, uh, also in potentially unreliable networks like mobile networks. So what we really want to provide is these kind of easy to use blocks that you can either choose or not use at your choosing. So you can build great products. Like if you want to build a Millennium Falcon, by all means, you can build that. But we can't have the building blocks too large because then if you walk away from this use case of I want a Millennium Falcon, then you know that's not going to fit for everyone's use case. So maybe you want a race car. So we try to look at the commonalities that we can then provide to different people of the community to then reuse in their use cases. Because in the end, you're always going to have some proprietary knowledge. So we want you guys to focus on your really value add, which is the proprietary knowledge there, and not kind of like the standard features like software management, configuration management, which are all kind of standard delivery part of the product. But they add us a lot of noise and a lot of implementation effort required there. So by also pushing kind of like the open source aspect of all of this, you can actually then benefit from each of the contributors in the open source community. So if you have like a reusable wheel that is great for you and you're going, well, there's no real like super proprietary knowledge there. So maybe if I contribute to that to the community, someone else can use it and they'll contribute something there. And then you can kind of um, have a free flowing um, kind of pool of ideas and components and plugins that so you can really push your product forward to make some really nice uh, products, which also minimize the maintenance that you need. Because if you're developing all these individual agents, then you know you don't get any benefit. So if you have like developers leave, then the development stagnates. Whereas if you have a community, you have a bit more of averaging out of like contributors. So it makes you a little bit more robust to let's say personnel turnover or anything in the company. So now part of the building blocks that we also deliver um, I think one thing that's really important and a lot of people also forget is not only the building blocks itself, but it's also the tooling surrounding the building blocks. So for example, that's uh, for people that don't know, that's a Lego block separator. So that enables to make it easier to, you know, pull parts across um, from blocks and put it somewhere else. Um, so we want to also deliver first class tooling surrounding the blocks. So whether that's from packaging tooling, or um, just kind of like best practices or like through the documentation, we really wanna add a really good experience because that can also influence how it's then used by each of the people. So moving on to the kind of the focus areas. Um, so for the 0 to 8 release, so we're building always upon all of the existing functionality. As you can see here, we have a lot of kind of different aspects of the project. So whether it's from like the IoT mappers, so you can customize whatever IoT provider that you want to use, um, to all of the configuration aspect and device management, um, and also like the first class kind of Mosquito bro or MQTT broker um, to allow that facilitate pluggability of different kind of item or components to communicate with each other. So part of the focus areas that we had was continuing on in the kind of the centralized functionality. Um, so doing the over-the-air updates of ThinEdge and its components. And also a kind of highlight is the configuration management for child devices. Then as we, because we're in a community, we also have a lot of community um, engagements going on at the moment. So uh, there was development for a plugin, uh, sorry, Modbus plugin, which will be showed later on. Um, but that's also a great example because the Modbus plugin can actually reuse other plugins like the configuration manager. So the Modbus plugin can really focus on Modbus. So you don't need to worry about the configuration aspect. It's really easy to, mon uh, to manage that to existing. And so it's the implementation effort is reduced 50% at least, and you can still get self-updating and all these kind of components. So you can really provide a feature rich plugin um, that really then focuses um, on, on the Modbus stuff and slimline or streamlines kind of your implementation. Then the next, um, we had the further uh, the furtherment of the Yocto integration journey. Um, so we added some kind of build instructions or a community member added the build instructions, how to build your own custom Yocto images. 
So where this is really interesting and it's kind of building on the, the fundamentals for the future is when we start to look at the operating system updates or the firmware updates, then this is kind of a precursor. You need to then be able to create your own images. So then you can deploy them to the devices. So I'd really recommend reading through the Yocto integration to have kind of like uh, get your feet wet to get comfortable building images because that's going to lay the groundwork for the future and nice future features. So focusing on the release highlights, so on top of the, the normal kind of improvements that we're always doing uh, to Affinage, uh, the two kind of highlights that we wanted to, to focus on was the over-the-air updates. So as mentioned before, that's really concentrating on making it easy to update ThinEdge itself and all of its related components. So whether that's you know the ThinEdge mapper um, or the agent or whatever, so updating all of those components. And so we've enabled that to be updatable from the cloud. So this is a fantastic feature because previously, yes, we always supported updating, but you'd have to run the get thin edge IO shell script. That always assumed that you had access to the device, which in a development scenario might be the case. But if we look at the real kind of production um, environments, usually you don't have like a easy to access SSH because you can't publish the public IP or whatever. So this enables, uh, enables you to update each of the components itself um, via the cloud. And for example, if you're using Comelocity, that means that you can actually update all the components exactly how you would update any other software on the device through Comelocity. So it really adds a streamlined interface and uniform interface that you don't need to train additional operators. So if they're already comfortable with updating other software, you don't need to say special training to update thin edge components. It's a seamless experience. And obviously being able to self update has a strong influence on how quick can you use the new features from a future version of thin edge. And so because we're bringing out nice features all the time, uh, this makes this upgrade path then seamless. Then I would say one of the key or like the, the premium feature that we added and put a lot of work into was the continuation of the child device story by adding configuration management. So with child devices, we already support like the measurements, events, alarms associated with that and the operations. But here we really added the abstraction level of the configuration management. So again, we're adding a building block, which is then to take the hard things away to implement. So we do all the cloud connection stuff, don't worry, and make a very easy to use interface then on the device side that then you can connect all of those devices in your IoT setup, because usually you know, you're not just talking about one device, you'll be a device which is then in the local network, and maybe that's a gateway device like you have on the right hand side. And then it's usually a number of devices which are interconnected. These could be existing devices or new devices. Um, so it's really important that you have the ability there to be adaptable how you communicate with these devices. So I'll have a, um, a demo of that later on. Um, but again, with the tooling, it's really important also so we don't just deliver a product like a, a feature and say, here you go. We really want to focus on, well, let's do a reference implementation to really show you how easy it is. So it's not just me uh, saying it's easy. So you, you should always be looking at you know, the code that is produced. And so that's why we're providing also a reference implementation, just so you can see um, how simple it is to implement and providing that. It's not about ease, but it's also um, being flexible so we can be adapt to your needs. So as normal, you can reach out to us um, at any point in time using our Discord channel um, via email. And obviously, because we're open source and hosted the source codes on GitHub, um, we're always open to new ideas or like feature requests. Um, please feel to reach out at any time. So thanks for listening and back to you, Phil. Excellent. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks, Ruben. So we've got a, a question, a question here, Ruben and Andre. Um, so if I just read out the question, so are there any reference implementations based on .NET, so C sharp, uh, that yeah. the team can have a look at? So currently, nothing that I know of. Um, however, I think the key with some of our interfaces that we look to do, um, we don't really mind what language you use because we always realize that. For a lot of the extensions, 
So I mean, whilst the core is written in Rust, we don't expect people to write extensions in Rust um, because everyone has their strengths or maybe have different kind of resources that you can leverage. Um, so a lot of our interface, you can, if you're building like a binary and it's like a CLI interface, we use the standard kind of exit code zero as everything's okay and not. For example, for the um, software management plugins, so you can actually write that very easily. And it's just a, I think they call it a console app in C Sharp. Um, and if you want a bit more of like a, a service-based plugin, um, then you really just need the capability that you communicate with MQTT. Um, and so that's, I believe that Payo probably has their MQTT library on C Sharp, um, that it should be fairly straightforward. So no exact implementation of C Sharp, but there's nothing specific that would then discourage people from using C Sharp, except for I would only just put the onus, I would go for a .NET, six or seven, something that can run on Linux, um, just as a hint. Brilliant, thanks Ruben. Um, but I think that's that's covered the question. So as we as we don't have any uh, other questions at this point in time, so I'd, I'd like to kind of thank, thank you, Andre and Ruben, for your, your presentation. And uh, we kind of run out of time for Q&A, just, just move on. So thank you, thank you very much. So let's um, let's start our technical uh, sessions. So the, the robust management of subordinate charred or leaf devices that are connected to an edge device is an increasingly common requirement as IoT deployments become more sophisticated. So I would like to introduce Albin Suresh, lead software engineer from the Thinish.io team, who's going to share how Thinish.io supports the management of charred devices. So Albin, over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Phil. So, hi everyone, I'm Albin Suresh. Uh, I'm a software developer here at Software AG, and I'm one of the maintainers of the Thinage.io open source project in GitHub. And this presentation is on how you can manage your child devices using Thinage.io. So, uh, with child devices, what I mean is any device that is connected to Thinage.io directly, okay? and uh, with the recent 0 0.8 release of Thinage, we have uh, introduced configuration management capability for child devices as, of, as our first step to providing a broader child device management capability for connected devices. Okay. So with this feature, what can you really manage? So what kind of devices can you manage? So you can manage any device ranging from a complex, say, uh, complex OT devices like PLCs, a constraint, uh, devices like PLCs, to smart devices like smart TVs, smart cameras, etc. So you just have to get them connected to Thinage, and then with the help of Thinage, you can manage these devices from a connected cloud. Okay, and I will uh, show you uh, how you can do this. Uh, you can remotely from a connected uh, IoT platform, you can remotely manage some configuration files on these connected devices. Okay, so before we jump into the demonstration, so let's talk about what a child device is. Okay, so in simple terms, a child device can be any device that is connected to a gateway device where Thinage is running on, which I'll refer to as the Thinage device for the rest of the session. Okay, so the use case is that so these child devices will be generating uh, data like measurements, events, alarms, etc., and uh, they would have their own software to be managed, configurations to be managed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you would want to have uh, an entity in the cloud for this device with its own identity. So you don't want to associate all the data of this device with the gateway device itself. Okay, so you want to see it as an independent device which you can manage independently from the cloud okay so and the association that exists in the cloud is that this child device will be a child device of the parent thinage device okay so that is what a child device is and uh, there are several flavors of it okay uh, the first one is simple ot devices like sensors or actuators connected to the gateway uh, to the thinage device or even complex ot devices like plcs which are further connected to more sensors and actuators okay so this is one deployment so these are the kinds of devices which 
usually in most cases cannot directly connect to the cloud okay but uh, needs the help of a gateway device and a thin edge installed on it to get them connected okay but you would want to see this entire <coughs> uh, device deployment with as independent devices in the cloud so this is the first use case the second use case is connecting smart devices say smart devices like a smart tv smart cameras or even devices like raspberry pis okay so these devices are capable of connecting directly to the cloud but sometimes you wouldn't want to do it uh, and one reason could be a security okay so when you have a fleet of devices such smart devices you wouldn't want to connect them all to the cloud directly and expose them all to the internet and all the risks associated with it but rather you might prefer to connect them to a secure gateway secured using thin edge okay hardened using thin edge and uh, and then they appear in the cloud so and you you can still even though they are not directly connected you can still manage them from the cloud as independent devices okay and another use case non secure non, non security related use cases where you don't want to push all the data from these devices to the cloud but you would rather do some pre processing of the data on the gateway device before uh, that before only the process data is sent to the cloud so this is another use case where this kind of a deployment is commonly seen okay and the final one is logical child devices so these are basically the child devices are not really not always physical child devices connected but it can even be uh just processes or containers running on the same gateway device itself which is acting like child devices in the cloud so they may or may not be connected to further sensors and actuators or even other devices but these are just logical processes running on the gateway and appearing as child devices in the cloud okay so these are the common uh, use cases or deployments that we have seen okay so now let's uh, see the feature in action uh, with a representative use case okay so here i'll demonstrate this feature with a, the use case of a company managing some digital signage assets uh, running some adver advertisement campaigns in areas where it's deployed okay so let me share my screen <clears throat> so hope you can see my uh, browser window and my terminal okay so for this demo i'll be using cumulosity iot cloud uh, for configuration management so here i've got my thin edge device already connected okay and it has a few child devices connected to it so these are some uh, say smart tv smart tv assets uh, deployed say in a hotel okay so there are tvs at the reception there are tvs at the uh, lobby all running different uh, sorts of ad campaigns okay now let me connect a third smart device okay so uh, i've i'm running uh, a piece of software called a child device connector which i'll talk to talk about later in detail okay so once i've started that i should see yeah so this device here okay and it has the configuration and uh, this de device has the configuration management feature enabled okay so what are the configurations that are available on the device okay so if i check this there is a file called con cfy configuration plugin an entry called cfy configuration plugin and looking at it you can know that okay these are the files that i can manage from it okay so i can view these files i can manage this file so this is actually uh, a playlist file where all the ad campaigns are listed okay so let's fetch this configuration file from that uh, from that device so i'm going to trigger a snapshot request okay demo cuz it seems so things that were functioning fine until a few minutes back just stops working ah uh, okay it looks like uh, my device is failing to connect to the cloud. Okay, so yeah, I probably will have to improvise, improvise a bit. Okay, so I'll yeah. Sorry about that. My it's failing to connect, so I'll I'll probably allow to yeah. 
just walk you through the process. OK, so with this feature, actually, uh, you can actually fetch a configuration file from the connected child device using the get config snapshot device option. OK, or you could even push a configuration file. So the configuration that was there on the device would something look something like this with the ad campaigns. So there is an ad campaign one and ad campaign two running on the device. OK, and uh, if you want to update that campaign, so you could actually. So there is another version of it here where a third ad campaign could be added. So all you could do, all you can need to do is just. Push. That request to the. To the uh, connected device and it should have actually uh, updated the file, but uh, for some reason I'm getting timeouts here. OK, so maybe uh, let's skip over that part and let's. Uh, let's look at how the feature actually works. Okay. So switching back to our presentation. OK, so. So this is how uh, a typical deployment would look like where you have a child device, an external child device, and uh, you have the gateway device where the energy is installed and you need another a small piece of software, another small piece of software called a child device connector, which can talk to the child device. OK, and these child devices uh, in the uh, in the world of IoT, they come in different forms and shapes and they talk in different kinds of protocols, right? So you need this small piece of software that can actually talk the protocol that is supported by the child device. OK, so and for this child device connector, this is the piece of software that you saw me running earlier during the demo. So we have written a reference implementation of this child device connector, which can interact with uh, ThinEdge over its well-known HTTP and MQTT APIs okay, in Python. So all you have to do is adapt the reference implementation uh, to, to, the, to the protocol that your child device supports. Okay? So over this protocol, this child device needs to do a few things, okay, and we'll talk about what are the responsibilities of this child device connector. Okay, so the child device connector needs to do the following. Okay, first responsibility is bootstrapping the child device itself. Okay, so bootstrap the child device by sending its configuration list to the ThinEdge device. Okay, so the configuration list is the list of configurations supported by that particular uh, child device. So the configurations you would like to manage from from the cloud. OK, so this is the list. So the connector needs to publish this list to the uh, to the net so that the is aware of what all configuration files to manage on that particular device. OK, and once it has the list available, then it will be sending configuration snapshot or configuration update request to the to that particular child device and the child device connector should be responding to this by uh, interacting with that external device over that third party protocol and interacting with the net over the local network via its well-known HTTP and MQTT APIs. So these are the responsibilities of the child device connector. And then what will ThinEdge do? Okay. ThinEdge is responsible for managing the supported configuration list of the child device, Okay, what it uploads. And then it needs to map the requests coming from the cloud to configuration snapshot and configuration update requests understood by the child device. Okay, So the commands, the ThinEdge commands that can be understood by the child device. And then the major part is downloading. So for example, in the case of a configuration update that you want to push from the cloud to the device, ThinEdge will be responsible for downloading that configuration file from the connected cloud okay, in a secure manner. So we don't want to push the responsibility of download to the child device itself, okay? Uh, because in many cases, the, uh, the connection may not be uh, reli um, reliable. OK, there would be flaky, flaky connections you'll have to deal with and uh, the security aspects as well. So ThinEdge will do all that heavy lifting. OK, it will ensure secure and resilient downloads of these files. And then once a file is fully downloaded, then it will make it available to the child device over the local network. OK, and then for the child device, it's just a download from the local network. OK, and similarly, even for the configuration snapshots uploaded by the child device, the, the, the ThinEdge uh, offering will upload that to the connected cloud 
So even if it takes n number of retries with flaky neck tracing stuff like that, uh, thin edge will ensure that the file is eventually uploaded to the connected cloud. Okay, so these are the responsibilities of thin edge in this case. Okay, and let's look at how this is going to happen. Okay, so it starts from the child device. So the bootstrapping part, the initial bootstrapping part, starts from the child device. So the child device connector gathers the configuration, supported configurations list from the child device. Okay. And using this list, it needs to prepare a TOML file called C8Y configuration plugin dot okay. And once this TOML file is prepared, uh, the device needs to upload that to ThinEdge. The connector needs to upload that to ThinEdge over HTTP. And once the upload is complete, it needs to notify ThinEdge over MQTT that this upload completed. Okay. And once the upload completes, ThinEdge will then further create the child device in the cloud if the child device doesn't already exist and then enable configuration management for that child device and then update its configuration list as well okay so this is the bootstrap flow now once and uh, looking at uh, the that configuration toml file that we talked about that the uh, connector needs to prepare so it's a toml file with a list of file entries okay and each entry has a path a file system path where you can find that configuration file and a, and a type which is a unique id to uh, uniquely identify that configuration file okay so for those who are familiar with the configuration management feature of thinedge itself uh, this this will be a familiar format because thinedge uses the same configuration file format for its own configuration management okay and now once configuration management is enabled how do you handle a configuration update request okay so this is the flow so the request will come from from the cloud. So the uh, configuration upload uh, download request will come from the cloud to ThinEdge. Okay, and ThinEdge will securely download the configuration file from the URL in the incoming request, the C8Y URL, and then it will host that file once it download once it's done fully downloaded. It will host that file locally and publish it via a TED URL. Okay, so that it's available for child devices to download over the local network and then once it's hosted locally the request a configuration update request is sent from ThinEdge to the child device connector over mqtt with the ted url in it okay. and once the child device connector receives this request it can optionally acknowledge that request by sending an executing status update to ThinEdge, which will further be propagated to velocity cloud and then after that child device needs to download this file from ThinEdge. So it's just a download over the local network. OK, so it should be fairly simple and straightforward. And once a file is downloaded, you the child device connector applies the configuration file on that external child device. So this is where it will push that configuration file to the device or using that third party protocol, whatever third party protocol that this child device supports. And once that update is complete, Notify child device, uh, sorry, notify ThinEdge that uh, the upload is complete with a successful status update, okay, which will further be uh, pushed to Cumulosity Cloud to mark that whole operation successful. Okay, so this is how the child device connector with the help of ThinEdge completes a configuration update flow. And configuration snapshot flow is fairly similar. So the request coming from the cloud, uh, optional acknowledgements getting sent back to ThinEdge. Uh, and then the only difference is that here, the connector will fetch the configuration snapshot from the child device over that third party protocol that it supports, and then upload the configuration file to the TED URL that it received in the request. And then once the, once the upload is complete, mark the operation successful by sending an MQTT message. And ThinEdge at the end of it will upload that file to Cumulosity. Uh, and then mark the operation successful in Cumulosity as well. So this is how a child device connector needs to handle uh, a configuration snapshot request. So this is it. That's it. So these are the three responsibilities that the child device connector needs to uh, cater to. Okay. Now coming to back to our uh, deployment diagram. So this is the commonly seen deployment for uh, for child devices where the ch you will uh, many of our customers will have a fleet of existing child devices which support some third party protocol and you would want to manage them so and you wouldn't want to install something new on all these devices 
to your existing fleet or reconfigure some something on this child devices. OK, but you would want to just probably just uh, have something on the gateway device itself and then using that just connect to your entire ex fleet of existing devices. OK, so you just install that child device connector on the gateway device itself and then. Uh, get uh, your child device connected to uh, thin edge. OK, so here the main advantage is that you don't need to touch the child device for any uh, any additional configurations or installations. OK, but for those customers uh, for which this deployment is not feasible, say a gateway device that is handling thousands of devices, different kinds of devices, then you you will have different kinds of agents for each device type that supports a different protocol, right? So you wouldn't want to put all of that into the gateway device itself. So if that's not feasible, and if your child device itself supports installation of new software, okay, then you can actually install the child device connector on the device on the child device itself and have it communicate with Edge over its well-known HTTP and MQTT APIs over the local network. So this is also another deployment option that is available. Okay, so yeah, that's basically uh, all about the feature. And uh, so what are the future areas that we are exploring? So how do we extend this further? Uh, so one thing that we are immediately considering is an out of the box child device connector. So as I said earlier, we have a reference implementation, reference connect connector implementation already written in Python that is available to you all to adapt. Uh, for your child device, but we are also thinking of uh, developing an out-of-the-box connector written in the secure, in a secure and memory-efficient way in Rust using Rust, and uh, where your third-party protocol-specific logic can be easily plugged into. So this is one option that we are considering, and another step is basically expanding this uh, child device management capability further. OK, so by supporting software management on child devices, so we already support configuration management, software management, log management, et cetera, on the thin edge device itself. So now we are slowly extending that to uh, the child device as well. We started with configuration management and next we can uh, uh, we are considering software management if there is interest for that. Okay, And then the other one is support for hierarchical child devices. So currently the current implementation only supports a single level of child devices, only the devices that are directly connected to the gateway device. But we have come across a few use cases where these child devices further has child devices, so uh, grandchildren devices or great grandchildren devices and stuff like that. So very complex deployments with multiple levels of hierarchy. So that is also another challenge that we are exploring. Okay, and the final one is actually a bulk management of a configuration. So, for example, if there is a gateway device that is managing multiple uh, multiple child devices, and you want to push a single configuration file update to all of them with a single click of a button, okay. So you push it once, and that uh, thin edge dispatches that to all the connected child devices of that particular config that particular type, so that uh, you, with a single click you update your entire fleet. So this is another direction that we are exploring. So uh, please give us your feedback on which is the uh, next feature that you would like to see implemented. And if we have missed any use case, yeah, feel free to share them as well. And uh, yeah, so with that, uh, I would like to conclude my session. So if you have any questions, feel free to raise them now or uh, even reach out to us on our Discord channels or even feel free to, feel free to create issues or start discussions on our GitHub project. So thanks for listening and sorry about the broken demo. Yeah, things happen. And so, yeah, thanks again. Uh, over to you, Phil. Excellent. Thank, thanks. Thanks, Alvin. It's pr brilliant, um, <coughs> brilliant, brilliant presentation. Sorry about the um, the demo effect there. So maybe there's an opportunity for us to um, uh, create a video we can kind of post on YouTube a little bit afterwards. So try and keep us a schedule. Um, to uh, so <clears throat> sustain with um, uh, the updates on, on release uh, zero point eight. So let's deep dive into another uh, feature evolution that um, uh, we, 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 uh, that's kind of new. McKean's to discuss. So best practice and recent national legislation require that the software in connected devices is regularly updated to avoid security vulnerabilities. So ThinEdge.io simplifies the management of software updates. But what about the update of ThinEdge.io itself? 
So for this, I would like to introduce uh, Rina Frugino, so a software developer in the Thinedge.io team, who will demonstrate how Thinedge.io can self-update, thereby ensuring that all devices, as all software in the devices, can be kept up to the latest version. So Rina, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, let me share my screen now. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rina Fuzino, a software engineer from CSIR team. Today, I would like to share an update that we made on 0 0.8 release, which enables users to update CH components over the air. In other words, ensuring CH updated having the functionality like you do for other applications that use in your IoT and the IoT ecosystem. So this is a basis of a software cycle. Let's think about it. First, you install CH on your device somehow, I would say, uh, but at some point, you will find a newer version is available. Probably, it has new features or bug fixes in the new, newer version. Then, of course, you want to install it, but then how are you going to do? Definitely, one option is to do the same procedure that you used when you installed the CH for the first time. Most likely, log into your device and run and update script locally. However, uh, we should remember that CH is a software to provide a connectivity to cloud IoT platform. Then why not choose an option that you update this version via your preferred cloud IoT platform? So, and as a first example, let's use Cumulosity IoT and update Debian package over the air. If you are not familiar with Cumulosity IoT, so let me explain it very briefly now. Cumulosity IoT is a cloud IoT platform which has a feature to manage install software on the connected device. Yeah, okay, so let me start the first demo now. So, first of all, I have the Raspberry Pi at my place, and uh, I already uh, configured all information which CNH requires, and now I'm going to connect to Cumulosity. Yes, now we are sure that uh, my device, Raspberry Pi, is connected to Cumulosity, and then let's see the version of it. We have the command pitch and the version is 0 0.8.0. .0. And also we can check it uh, by APT list. So I run APT list. So you see, we all now set the components uh, version 0 0.8.0. .0. But actually in our website, uh, we have already 0 0.8.1 release. So what I'm going to do is to update the version from 0 0.8.0 to 0 0.8.1. Then, yeah, so this is uh, my Raspberry Pi connected to Cumulosity already. Yep, and then, so again, that's need, Cumulosity requires a little bit of preparation to use this software management feature to update your packages. So I have created sketch software information in the Cumulosity's software repository, and I uploaded uh, uh, 0.8.1 packages I just got from the release node here on the GitHub. Then now, let's use software. Pitch. Yeah, as you see also, or listed the pitch. Uh, components uh, with the 0.8.0 version. Then now I'm going to update the sketch. 0.8.1 and apply changes. It will take time a little bit. Okay. Very good, now it marks green, that means it's successful. So back to my Raspberry Pi. So let's 
execute that again, and you see now 0.8.1 version. And also we can check from APT list. Yeah, here 0.8.1 is reported. And also the last one we can check from Cumulosity, which is software version it's reported. H. Yes, 0.81. Very good. So, okay, now you see, so upgrading H was successful. Then now back to this slice. So now, time to look at all the CNS packages to understand the difference and the difficulty of self-update. As of today, we release eight different Debian packages as we as I listed here. Eight. And first, we can group them non daemon or demo. Packages are managed by init system, for example, system CTL in Debian OS, Ubuntu, whatever. So as I did now with Tetch package, updating non daemon package is quite straightforward. The Tetch package, which I updated now, was in this category. There's no background process, that's why it's not daemon. Uh, therefore, we can update these packages anytime or when we want, apparently. On the contrary, updating daemon packages may be a little bit tricky because during the update, the restart of the daemon process is required to apply the binary of the newer version. However, besides Tetch Agent uh, or the other daemon packages, these four uh, can be updated by just one step as well as non daemon packages. So, yeah, better to see it. So, that's why I'm going to show you the second demo now how to update Tetch Mapper. It's a demo package uh, via Cumulosity IoT as an example. Okay, then again, back to my uh, Raspberry Pi. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, there's a pointer stop. Uh, yeah, as you see here already, it's mapper is definitely 0 0.8.0 version. And also we can see that status of that mapper service. It's uh, controlled by system CTL because I'm using Ras uh, Raspberry Pi OS. Yeah, so uh, since five minutes ago, uh, it's running. Okay, then yeah, go to Cumulosity. So very similar to this. So I have already uh, prepared the edge mapper. Yeah, here, sorry, I found it now. Yeah, so here, edge mapper 0 0.8.1 for MHF. And I'm going to update from here now. The point is edge mapper process is still running. Then I'm going to trigger the software update. Okay. Yes, great. Um, now that mapper update operation is marked successful. Then let's check what happened here. My last verify. But let's check with the APT list. You can see that that mapper is now 0 0.8.1. And also check the status. Yes, it's still running. But if you see it, this is the uptime and since 30 seconds ago. So actually, so during the process of uh, a package update, uh, the stitch mapper uh, process is stopped and started again. Okay, then also let's confirm 
which version is reported to Cumulosity? H. Yes, great. Version 0.8.1 is reported for Tetch Mapper. So again, the system was successful. This is very good. So let's continue this slide. So as you see now, you could see the procedure to update Tetch Mapper. Tetch Mapper is exactly the same uh, as what I did for Tetch Package. So then the last part I need to touch this e exception. So there's only an exception, which is Tetch Agent. In short, after updating a Tetch Agent, you need to restart the Tetch Agent service to apply the new version. The question is why do we need to why do we need a restart of the of the service? Sorry, uh, because Tetch agent process must be running during updating the Tetch agent package. We cannot queue the Tetch agent process in the middle of updating the package by APT. Therefore, the old version binary is still used unless you restart the service. And finally, after you restart the service, the binary of Tetch agent will be replaced to the new version. So I'm going to show you the last demo how to update Tetch agent over the air. Yeah, again, just a confirmation Tetch agent on the My Raspberry Pi is 0 0.8.0. And the status, let's check it. Tetch agent service running important and also uh, uptime since nine minutes ago. And then Cumulosity slide. So again, it's the same procedure. So I have already uploaded this Tetch Agent 0.8.1 package. And then I figure now. So wait a bit. Okay, great. It's green. So let's check first. Uh, package information by APT. So see here, Tetch agent is now 0.8.1. But we need to be careful to check the status of Tetch agent service. So this one is running since 10 minutes ago. So that means still all uh, binary is used for Tetch agent. Now we need to uh, restart the Tetch agent service. One option, of course, I can restart from here locally. Uh, but this is over the air self update. So I would like to Restart the service from Cumulosity, not using this terminal. Well, Cumulosity has one function. It is called Cloud Remote Access. Um, so you can uh, establish this SSH connection from Cumulosity to your device, which is connected to your Cumulosity tenant. And I have configured everything. Uh, I'm going to connect. So this is my Raspberry Pi. To confirm it, maybe I can check the status of the pet agent from here. Status. Yes, 11 minutes ago, yes. So this is really the same Raspberry Pi that I'm using now. Then this does the service, it's easy. Now, the agent service is restarted. I can confirm from my another terminal. Yeah, it's seconds ago. So, uh, 
this is uh, the procedure how to update Tetch agent package over the air with Kimrosti IoT. So until now, uh, you already saw all the patterns of the uh, CH package with update over the air. So as a last part of the presentation, I would like to mention the potential user experience enhancements that are in our roadmap. The first one is directly related to what I presented now. Uh, the Debian package its agent is an exception that requires a service restart after updating the package. Uh, we are planning to omit this step and to make the package unable to update non-stop. And the second one is uh, having a Debian repository. As of now, we don't upload the Debian packages to any Debian software repositories. If we set up the repository, for example, you won't need to upload the packages on Cumulosity IoT. Uh, as I show you today, so I uploaded the Debian packages to Cumulosity directory, but you will, uh, you won't need that step anymore once we have the uh, Debian repository. And also, uh, managing packages for multiple architecture would be easier in the end. And the third one is uh, an all-in-one meta package. We have eight packages as of now, and when you need to update them, you need to list these packages explicitly. The, the all-in-one meta packages will reduce the steps to update things. So in summary, we are still working on enhancing the usability of self-update of CNH. So track our work on the CNH GitHub repository. Yeah, this is all my presentation. Thank you for your listening and back to Phil. Excellent. Th thanks, Rina. So it's a brilliant, brilliant presentation. So let me um let me retake uh, retake control here. Let's skip on. And also, if there's any questions that come up uh, that you see, Rena, please um, re respond to those in the chat. And maybe sort of pick up any answer questions at the end. So let's let's change gears. Uh, so and actually to understand how Synage.io is being evolved by our contributing partners. So with Microsoft's recent IT signals report indicating that connected product manufacturers expect to increase their investments in predictive maintenance. There's a growing need to deploy machine learning at the edge. So I would like to introduce Yingting Yan, so AI software engineer, software AG, who will demonstrate how Thinedge.io simplifies the deployment of and um, deployment and operations of machine learning, mo machine learning models at the edge. So Xingting, uh, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Jingting Yan. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer in uh, software en engineer in software AG, uh, doing the thing and build project development. And really, thank you for this meetup that I can have a chance uh, to introduce the thing ML. So today, uh, I'm going to do a demo of setting up a normal detection model on an edge device, and I will start with the introduction of the thing ML, then uh, the use case which is a normal detection on um, network intrusion. Then uh, I will do a deployment workflow, which is using ThingML and by leveraging ThingAge IO techniques. So finally, uh, the live demo, uh, I will walk through all the steps of the deployment to let the edge device providing on-device analytical results. Um, so, uh, in the enterprise or industrial IoT space, uh, machine learning has become a key focus for a company by enabling them to generate valuable, res uh, valuable insights uh, from vast array of sensors on machine, assembly line, and industrial robots. So one of the biggest challenges in large-scale industrial machine deployment today uh, is to keep track of the functioning of the machines So uh, and trying to minimize the downtime. So 
combine uh, machine learning uh, with the deep flow of data generated by a flood of newly connected devices bring huge benefit by making predictive maintenance possible. So AI powered IoT devices can proactively detect different type of event through its local sensor data and trying to take action without human intervention. The events uh, could be a potential failure or external threat, a threat or simply something that's just required minor tuning. By reacting this kind of events in an automatic real-time and intelligent way, the downtime of device can be minimized and which eventually helps um, maintenance cost saving. So here is why we have the ThinkML to help each device become smarter. Uh, ThinkML uh, actually is a, a library leveraging ThinkAge IO techniques to help users deploy machine learning model on edge devices. Then uh, with the machine learning model being deployed, uh, ThinkML immediately enable edge device the capability of generating analytical results. ThinkML itself uh, is similar, has a similar concept like a tiny ML, but without a lot of software compilation efforts. So using tiny ML might need each specific view for different algorithm in different microcontrollers. But now uh, ThinkML support ARM32, uh, ARM64 device, and in this type of device, it is not constrained in very specific type of uh, algorithm as long as your deployed model is exported in all the next formats. So uh, here I provide a one use case uh, to demonstrate what ThingML can provide. And this use case here is aiming for detecting network intrusion. So we use the botnet uh, uh, data set. It has uh, 115 features, including many different attributes from a text source and um, network packets. The data set has labeled 10 type of attack and the one benign. And a bot in this data set means uh, a compromised device being penetrated from a malware. And the malware may utilize a compromised IoT device to to steal sensitive data or even trying to send uh, the ransom software attack and this create security crisis in the IoT space. So as mentioned in previous slide, uh, detecting possible attack before it becomes a real problem will help to prevent uh, catastrophic consequence and help a business to avoid unexpected loss. So we use this data set. Uh, it could be trained as an anomaly detection model, uh, for example, like one class SM, SVM. The model can help an edge device uh, to monitor network status, knowing it's now in benign or is under attack. Uh, besides anomaly detection model, we can also um, um, uh, enhance the edge device further using a classification model. So here it's for example, like a random forest that's different from a normal detection model. This is a classification model that can help each device to be not just knowing that yes, no to the attack, but also identifying different type of the attacks. So we know uh, that ThingML can provide different type of analytical results according to the type of model we deployed. So now in our case, I'm using one class SVM uh, to detect possible bots and the possible attack. So here I'm going to uh, mention that the process how we enable machine learning capability on each device. So the first of that immediately we need will be a model. Then we uh, a machine learning model could be trained and validated by various model training tools, such as scikit-learn, PyTorch, TensorFlow, R package carriers, or a micro, uh, the machine learning workbench, which is also one of the microservices provided from Cumulosity. And once model is trained and exported in an ONS file, then we wrap the file as the machine learning artifact turbo package 
Then we're trying to update the table to the Cumulosity software repository. The next step, uh, use the Cumulosity, uh, Cumulosity Management Console to push the machine learning model to all the connected edge devices. So uh, now edge devices have their own machine learning computation capability. Then finally, each device can start to generate its own analytical result by feeding its own raw sensor data to the just deployed model. So the Cumulosity Management Council can see the anomaly score and the prediction from the model. And then in this demo, uh, I was trying to execute a simulator on each device to simulate the situation that uh, each device generate its sensor data, then proceed on device computation, then send back the analytical results via MQTT channel back to a uh, cloud. So uh, here I will do a demo. Now, uh, what I have right now is the uh, uh, one class SBM uh, model that is exported in ONX format and that is trained from a data set. Then we, what we did is trying to uh, zip it into a, a machine learning artifact table. So we do the models, pipelines, resource, and into a, a table. So now we have that file already. Then we do, we go to the Cumulosity uh, control panel. We go to a software repository. Then we uh, have a so the machine learning model that we just uh, generate. Artifact. Then we put the description, detection model. Then we know if the thing is device. Then uh, just a uh, uh, different from the APT software install, we use uh, ThingML right now. Then we know this is a non-meditation model version one. Then the most important thing we need to have the tail version here and the mentioning as the ThingML. Then the web that uh, each device knows that right now we are deploying the machine learning model. So once this is up though, we add the software. And now we can go to the devices. And this is the demo device we have. And we can check now. It already has the uh, thing age uh, uh, installed and connected to the cloud. And we also have the thing ML base. Um, already installed that have uh, let device have ability capability to deploy the model then right now what we're going to do is to deploy the model so we select the one we just uh, upload it then we apply the change and now uh, the cumulosity cloud will help us to push the machine learning artifact directly to the edge device Just trying to refresh. Okay, yeah, actually it's already laid. Then we can see uh, you will have some of the uh, information from here. But now uh, we would like to go to the carpet that I already create a graph that can help us to see the uh, sensor data easily. So right now we don't have any sensor data because I haven't started the simulator. Then right now I'm going to start a simulator. We will start to do the on device uh, computation. Model. Okay. So uh, right now I have the simulator ready and generate a lot of sensor data. Right now I still put that on cloud because I would like to let uh, users to see that uh, in the beginning, if you don't have the machine learning model, then you will see a lot different kind of the raw data from uh, raw sensor data from the device. And 
uh, if we send in all this raw data back to cloud, it will kind of like generate uh, the network bandwidth. But right now, if we provide the machine learning capability on device, we can get rid of all these raw sensor data, but we just only provide the anomaly uh, situation like, OK, the, the red uh, value here is the anomaly label showing like, OK, right now at the same time you are still safe in B9 status, or maybe some of situation you may under attack that you need to take some act, uh, action from that. And the, another part is the anomaly score that you can see is high or low to knowing the uh, label of the possibility of the attack. So, um, this is uh, the demo that we would like to show, and with uh, uh, on-device computation, we send back just only the insights of the situation, then we can all get rid of this kind of the raw sensor data sending back to the cloud. So this is the uh, demo, and uh, thank you all for uh, listening to this uh, uh, slide, and thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Yintin. Brilliant, brilliant demo. So thank you. Thank you for that. So let me um, just take control again. So um, so what I would like to do is to um, kind of come on to our, our last our last presenter. So we've, we've sort of saved the, um, the, the, the best to last. So there, there are hundreds of OT protocols used by industrial equipment um, industrial equipment in factories and buildings and vehicles, et cetera. Uh, some of those examples being kind of Modbus, uh, Canbus, Profibus, Bagnet, OPC Way. Um, with the equipment at many sites only supporting a single protocol, edge devices that need to be flexible to integrate with a, a number of different equipments on those equipment on those sites, regardless what protocol they have. So without further ado, I'd like to, like to introduce uh, Jan Humble, so Director IoT Solution Architecture from Software AG. Who will demonstrate how Thinish.io simplifies the deployment of OT protocol adapters onto edge devices that allows insights to be gained from a wide range or heterogeneous range of industrial equipment. So, Jan, over to you. So, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm Jan Humble. I lead the solution architecture team for our IoT Center of Excellence here in the Americas. And I want to thank as well uh, Yingting, uh, Ruben, Rina and Albin as well to, for laying ground the foundation of some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about here today. So my my demo seems to be more simplified this way when I don't have to go through all those things as well. So I strongly recommend if you're just joining for this session to go back and look at those those aspects as well, which is going to tell you a lot of the inherent capabilities of the platform that's going to facilitate some of the stuff we're going to talk about now. So in terms of, you know, as part of the field organization, I'm for part of the sales team. And I help out on the technical, me and myself, and the, and the technical support team uh, that I lead. Uh, we we um, we provide all the technical support and architecture conversations to be had with various type of customers across different industries and and verticals. And we typically find ourselves in situations where we need to support multiple types of protocols. So in terms of the manufacturing facility, in terms of the clinical facilities in the healthcare space, in terms of <clears throat> other types of commercial offerings like smart buildings, energy conservation, and those type of things, we typically find ourselves with trying to establish a solid foundation, a cohesive foundation to be able to, to implement kind of device connectivity. Uh, and device connectivity, that means device connectivity across a multitude of different asset types. That could be machines, it could be sensors, it could be other uh, industry, industrial PCs, or any type of assets that we want to monitor and control remotely there. So what typically is a challenge in that space there? OK, so we have typically you might want to have to introduce some sort of gateway device, a proxy or an implementation of a change in the firmware or software environment of these vendors or a third party kind of auxiliary gateway to be able to provide that 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 access, that proxy into an IoT platform. I, of course, am biased towards uh, Software AG's own uh, Cumulosity IoT platform as well, but this it kind of um, relates to any other IoT platform as well. So when we typically find ourselves in these type of environments, there's tons of different, not only the, the uh, protocols to be able to support, but different deployment strategies and methodologies and disciplines that we face there. So it's nice to have a solid foundation to be able to build across those. And even uh, identifying just a handful or even a couple of different protocols here establishes 
challenges in, in themselves, for exam, exam, example, managing the, the configuration of these across different disparate, disparate devices, configurations that can be complex in, in themselves, and uh, the ability to for support multiple types of protocols as well, per, perhaps in a single gateway device as well. So as an OEM, for example, if you're using some part of the thin edge technology, you might want to have a particular foundation of that adapter that you would host on that gateway and be able to deploy and just enable the feature functionality that you need on a case by case basis. So that is an incredibly nice facility to be able to have that as such, right? So I'm going to select a couple of these protocols and show you how we have implemented or in the way of evolving that type of integration to these kind of field bus protocols, which are kind of the common practices in the industries. Modbus in particular and OPC UA, but we stumble across all multiple of other type of things here. So now the things that I'm going to show you as well, just kind of to preface some of this, is that we've been working towards um, evolving or transitioning more towards a thin edge strategy to support uh, kind of our investment in the thin edge because that's kind of the way forward for us, providing kind of that consolidated holistic approach towards uh, providing integration across the board. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we work with partners that can, are also developing proprietary type of uh, in, uh, protocol integration forms as well there. So this applies to kind of every type of conceptual model that we or discipline that you're trying to uh, approach there as well. So imagine yourself and you have with this thin edge foundation, you have your face like with, with different types of hardware manufacturers or hardware providers and the gateway side of things, for example, things like uh, Wagos, HMS Flexis, Red Lion, Sierra Wireless, you name it. You want to have each of them have kind of their own approach. Most of these are open platforms of such that so you can embed in your own agents. And this is a perfect uh, opportunity now to embed thin edge as such, because then you have a generalized set of platform that you can, if, for example, you have a, a, an inventory challenge in your in the gateways you want to do, and you have to kind of procure from multiple vendors as such. You still have a single um, foundational piece to be able to work from. So that's a, also a nice feature there that you, you get out of the box. Uh, and then we can integrate. Uh, typically, the integrations that are needed here are directly through PLCs, through the protocol gateways, directly on control buses, and there are different ways to be able to integrate to these different protocols. Right? We mentioned the the, the ability to introduce a gateway or even um, to rework some of the firmware inside on some of these devices, but as well the ability to, in multi-hierarchical way, like the way that Alvin was explaining, to be able to manage child devices and children of children devices and those type of things is incredibly important as well because we never know what type of topology we're going to be facing in some of these environments as well. So it's nice to have that secure and reliable connectivity, like the solid foundation within Edge. We have we provide an entire monitoring facility and an and update over the air of some of these things. As I, as I mentioned before, it can get relatively complex. Some of the industrial sites are remote or very difficult to get to or different, different to logistically kind of operate on, very costly to send a technician over, the, over there as well. So incredibly important to have all these over the air features. The things that uh, Arena was talking about to be able to self update the firmware itself. Maybe you're doing also a migration from one platform to another. That's kind of inherently out of the box to be able to do those type of things as well. <clears throat> and also the benefits to introduce things like ThinML in there, like this is a, a major, major ask from customers there. Now that you have that integration in place, that you want to be able to push those analytics onto on the edge. For various, of course, for various reasons there, for cost factors, for example, you don't want to start pushing large volumes of data into the cloud, but you want to have very rapid response times on the analysis of the tags that you're streaming from those different protocols there as well. Okay, so this gives you also a nice architecture to work from. So you have all the underlying necessary pieces there to just concentrate on formalizing kind of your integration strategy across the protocol specifically, and don't have to worry about anything else there. Don't have to worry about the over the air, the mapping onto potentially multiple IoT platforms or target environments that you want to issue that data into, right? And also the remote configuration and logging facilities that you might need there as well. Now, features like ML and those types of things are nice to have as well as part of your ongoing journey, but typically the ongoing, the primary challenge is to be able to integrate in a seamless way and to be able to administer all these devices remotely in a cohesive way. So I'm going to uh, show you a little bit of a demo of how that looks like. Uh, I'm gonna select, I'm gonna transition over to 
<clears throat> again, I said I was partial to cumulosity, so I'm gonna uh, gonna start there. So I have a couple of thin edge devices, um, one being a Debian uh, gateway, Debian based gateway uh, that's running on the system there. And what I'm gonna do in this one is I'm gonna set up a Modbus environment or Modbus uh, plugin into the thin edge, into the raw thin edge installation that I have. So essentially I have my thin edge running, right? And typically what I wanna do here is enhance it. I can of course, from the very beginning have wrap everything up in a single package and, and off you go and you deploy it on, on my device or it's firmware update process or whatever. But in this case, for example, let's say I want to add in my own plugin. Again, I'm, we are creating a plugin separately from the foundational or the core pieces of the thin edge. We just want to de deliver kind of the, the integration into that, um, into that protocol, in this case, Modbus, right? So what I'm gonna do, or what I have preset here to do already. So in, in real time here, in my software repository, I already have imported in this particular piece of software, which is my Modbus plugin. This is gonna feed or, or couple in into the thin edge installation in that Debian device there, okay? I specify which version. I can upload various different types of versions there for different architectures as such into, into my software repository, which is gonna be then accessible for me to upload it to that device. And Cumulosity has also a nice feature to implement things like uh, device profiles in the case that I want to tell that a particular type of device or a, a class of device has to conform, conform to a particular set of software versions, and in which case those devices will automatically self-update themselves with the, with the latest version that is available to them. But in this case, I'm going to do it straightforwardly, manually. So I'm going to go back to my thin edge device and Although I have preloaded some of these things already, I go into my software here. I can already see all the software that I installed here, but I can also install uh, the new one that I have preset there, the TE Modbus plugin. Uh, we went through in a, how to do that in a previous session there. So I already installed that TE Modbus plugin, and what that happened, what the the workflow around that is that it up it automatically pulls down that. Uh, that software piece, uh, that Debian distribution in this case, for example, it automatically deploys it. It sets up the configuration for you to also configure it remotely. So second to that, I want to be able to configure that device remotely. So I'm going to go, go into the configuration. That is, I want to tell it, for example, <clears throat> what is the Modbus service that I want to connect to and all the mappings required there. Now, imagine that I have a configuration as such remotely in a separate file, something like this. <clears throat> Let me just make that a little bit bigger. And Modbus, if you're not familiar with the with the protocol, you essentially have to connect it to a a servers a, and a particular address, and also define various registries, very, 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 I'm sorry, various registers mappings that you need to do into the platform or decoding of the registry values that you're getting pushed into or the tags you need to select. For example, the register you're interested in, interested in. <clears throat> pulling data from and also decoding those registries in different ways. For example, there's a, a formal length into the bits that form part of each value and you can extract that value as such, uh, depending on different kind of heuristics around that. And here as a, as a first approach, for example, for this particular implementation of this plugin, I have kind of a, a, a TOML file that I can define some other configuration through. Okay, so I have different registers defined here for that particular device or a particular machine that I'm going to be connecting to, various different registers and such. That configuration I can push into my device as well through the configuration here. I, in the particular configuration I'm interested in is a, these are kind of all the configurations that I have enabled for that device that I want to be able to modify it remotely. In this case, my Modbus devices. This is the one that is pre-installed. I can get a snapshot already. I have a snapshot automatically here of what the current configuration on that device is. But if I want to update a new configuration for it, <clears throat> I have different configuration. I can filter out from my configuration repository here that I want that I want, and I can push that into my device as such. So once I have that configuration up in the device, everything that the services is running now, the thin edge is connected already. Uh, so now it's pulling data, it's doing through the mapper also capabilities of the thin edge, it's doing the conversion into specific cumulosity, which I, yeah, I set it up to connect to. Of course, I can also connect it to Azure IoT Hub if I needed to, or any other type of other target there. In this case, I've already set that up, 
And the way that this works, you, you saw that kind of the case for child devices as well, right? So this is an agent, this is like a proxy into a, a, the, those devices that reside elsewhere. So this is gonna be represented uh, through a child device. So a child device, this is my configuration of that service and those registries that I wanted to connect to, and this is represented now as a child device that I'm managing and monitoring there. <clears throat> and those measurements I can see here, the ones that are being pushed through the platform at the moment, right? These are a, a simulator that I have running in the, in the background for a Modbus service as such with different registries and coils and various different things. If you're interested in that, I, I recommend you read upon what the Modbus protocol looks like as well. A nice feature here as well, um, of cumulosity that we are evolving constantly as well is the ability to also within the same interface not only have to like rely on a, a textual based <clears throat> configuration of the system as well we also have a visual configuration abilities as well through some of these things i'm going to transition over to opc ua to show you some of that as well so in this case, you have the Modbus inter interface connected to very seamless to kind of build your own plugin or even perhaps modify that plugin accordingly to your own specific needs. Maybe enhance it further, make it more sophisticated, create your own IP around that as well. And you can deploy it easily, integrate it to the overall packaging and deploy it out in the field in every which way. Or have that as part of a multi-setup, multi-protocol setup that a single agent feature would, it would give you kind of access into as well, which is very nice to have as well, a single foundation to be able to administer those things. Uh, so now I'm gonna transition over now. I also have now um, an OPC UA Thin Edge agent, which is it works exact, essentially analogously to the Modbus one. In this case, I have <clears throat> my Thin Edge deployed on a, an actual Docker container at this point in time, but I can specify, um, so, uh, sorry, I'm going to go into, let's go back to this group, and I'm going to have the, the gateway agent, rather, which is the agent that is going to administer the, the proxying into the, um, into the LPC UA server that I'm going to be setting up. In this case, for example, the agent as I deployed on the edge, this is exactly the same plugin into the thin edge that we're working with Modbus. I guess I've uploaded the LPC UA mod, uh, plugin into it, and that gives me additional functionality into Cumulosity. In this case, I have the ability to configure my OPC UA server here. I'm pointing it to my local uh, OPC UA server simulator at the moment. I can add other servers as well because this is one too many. The agent supports multiple server configurations if you need to. And as once I have that set up, I can do the mapping directly in Cumulosity. I don't have, for example, to go into a textual file to be able to do that configuration itself. So in, I have device protocol support here. I have multiple such. Uh, I can create a new device protocol here. So example, OPC UA, and I can select some of the servers I already pre-connected. Uh, pre, uh, they will show up here, and I can select kind of the node, the node root that I want to select and start building uh, the extraction from exactly. So I won't go into this as well. I have this particular address space set up for this OPC UA server. Uh, but once I have that set up, I select kind of the route that I want to pull from. I have already one preset here. <clears throat> and here I can select, I, I can specify, for example, the polling intervals and those type of things. And also the mapping configurations between some of those objects. And essentially OPC UA gives you kind of a set of objects that you can pull data from with certain types of conversions that you need to do there as well. In this case, I have a particular power from a driver of one of these machines. And in this case, I have defined that this particular um, node object value I'm pulling out through this path configuration in that address space that I have for OPC UA. And what do I want to do with that value? Well, I have different options how to want to pr promote that into Cumulosity or to your, <coughs> or in Cumulosity specifically here, yeah, of course. I want to send a measurement, a, a, a kind of a numerical value into the platform as well. I can also, if, if the <coughs> type of that object allow me to, I can also send, for example, the content that as an event or create an alarm or something like that as well. So once I have that set up, I now have a, a configuration of all the different mappings that I need, including the server configuration and so on. In the same way that I did with Modbus, then I have now <clears throat> an instance of that new uh, protocol support, protocol mapping that is going to show up as a, <clears throat> as a new device here for me. And that once I have that configuration in place, 
then I can start looking at the measurements and validate that as accurate and so on. So I have now power, which is now being pushed into the platform as such. So let's go back into a minute and hopefully we'll get some data in here. There we go. So we start pulling some data on the minute there from that OPC UA server. <clears throat> so just to re re recap, the ability to quickly start implementing different types of protocols or pull existing protocols, for example, with some of our offerings or part of the community um, authoring that's, that's happening at the moment and be able to plug it in and set up your own environment, uh, automatically have that monitoring and configuring that and also then push that or have the ability to then start pushing some of the ML capabilities, machine learning or analytical capabilities on top of the data extremely rapidly. And, a, and, a, and providing you a solid foundation to be able to deploy multiple protocols simultaneously here as well. Incredibly powerful. And then want to leave you with um, a little <clears throat> URL that you can also find. Sorry, let me just go back to my that where you can start finding some of examples of implementations of some of these protocols as well. So that's it for me and uh, back to you, Phil. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Jan. So you, uh, you went through a, a, a lot in a short space of time there. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for keep, keeping to time. So that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. So uh, Albin, if you're still available, do you want to um, rerun that small section of the demo just to make people aware of actually what we were really showing there in the child devices? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Phil for making up some time for this. OK, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, let me share my screen. Hopefully this time everything holds up. OK, so <clears throat> so uh, this was the uh, use case that I actually wanted to demonstrate, a realistic use case of child devices. So uh, the use case was something like this. So uh, it was a digital signage management company managing a few smart digital signage assets, some smart TVs that are deployed as part of their fleet. OK, so this so you have all seen uh, these kinds of digital signage assets in say airports, railway stations, uh, hotel lobbies and all that, or even in your office spaces. Right? So so here is a company uh, that is managing some of these assets and running their advertisement campaigns and other things uh, using these TVs. OK, so here. Uh, I've got my uh, Thinish device connected. So, so there is a location, say, assume a hotel where uh, there are several of these assets, several of these TVs deployed in different locations, and they are all connected to. They are all not directly connected to uh, the internet, but rather connected to Cumulosity uh, via a gateway device, which is the Thinish device. Okay. So here I've got that device connected, and among the child devices, I can see some of these TVs. Okay. So let me just navigate to the one that I'm going to manage now. And if you go to that, so you will see all the <clears throat> available options. So the management dashboard, so the measurements dashboard, even dashboard, and even the and specifically the configuration management dashboard for that particular asset. So this this TV is the child device of the thinnest device. Okay. Now let me just get the terminal also running. Now just to see. What are the configuration sub files available on the device? So you will see a list of configuration entries here. And the first one is C8Y hyphen configuration plugin. The TOML file that I uh, showed uh, where the configuration list is uh, list is populated. So you can just fetch that. And you can see that these are the files that can be managed on that particular child device. So there is a path, the path of the file, the actual file on the child device. So there are two files here. So for that particular asset, there is a config.json that, that manages some of the configurations of the display unit itself. And there is a play, playlist.json file, which is uh, the, uh, the file that has a list of the campaigns, the advertisement campaigns that are running on that particular device. Okay, so let's see. What 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 are what all campaigns are running on that particular device? So let's navigate to the playlist tree and let's fetch that using the get config snapshot device snapshot from the device option. And once it's complete, so you can see a JSON file. So 
from this, you can know that you know that there are two advertisements running on it. So there is an ad, uh, advertisement one, so an advertisement of the new S class, and another advertisement for their Vision uh, electric uh, electric line. Okay, so these are the two advertisements that are running on currently on the device. So this is the current snapshot. Now I would like to update the campaign. So I would like to uh, replace this advertisement three with another one. See an advertisement two. Okay, so let me. So I've got some uh, configurations here. Okay, so the version one of it has just advertisement one and adver advertisement two. So I'm going to replace the existing campaign uh, with the new campaign list. Okay, so what I can do is just push that and you can see that it succeeded. Okay, now just to validate that it really succeeded. So let's fetch it again from the device. And yeah, as you can see, it got updated. So 81 and 82 instead of 83. And if you were noticing in the background, so I've got a uh, MQTT listener uh, on all the uh, all the MQTT communication that's happening over the uh, over the MQTT broker for on on the touch topics. And here you can see that the requests, the config snapshot request was actually coming to the child device and the child device was actually responding to those configuration snapshot with the executing and successful status back to back uh, and uploading the configuration file in between. But that's an HTTP interaction which you can, cannot see with this thing. So yeah, so this is the uh, demonstration of that use case. And uh, yeah, this is how you can manage uh, configuration files on your child devices by just getting them connected to Pinage. And for those who are familiar with the configuration management feature of uh, the parent device, the Tinex device itself, the experience is exactly the same. Okay, so from, starting from the configuration file and uh, the rest of the flow as well. Okay, so yeah, that's all I wanted to show. Thanks, Will, for that opportunity. So over to you. Uh, excellent. Thank, thanks, Albert. And um, it's a brilliant, brilliant demo. So um, uh, good, good comeback from the demo effect. So we um, we have also I think um, there's a, there's a hand hand raised. Let me um, uh, hi Solomon. So I'm just going to open your mic for a second if you want to raise your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, my question would be uh, for the child device configuration management. Uh, the way you demonstrated is there will be a device agent which will be listening. And then responding accordingly. But for the um, for the actual teenage, the configuration management is already handled by the the teenage instance itself, or is there any custom logic that has to be handled as well? Yeah, hey Solomon. So uh, I believe you were talking about that child device connector piece of software, right? So yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. So the child device connector is actually the bridge between the external device and the net. So uh, this connector will be receiving the requests from the net over the local MQTT uh, channel. OK, so it will. So this and the response, the prime responsibility of this connector is to talk to that external device over whatever protocol that it supports. And we can build some of some out of the box connectors that talk some very uh, commonly used protocols, right? Like say HTTP or Modbus or something like that. Okay, but for really customized devices, then there is always this element of uh, customizability where the device owner or the device developer will have to add some piece of logic that defines how you can fetch a configuration from that device or how you can push an update to that device. Okay, so and this again, uh, all the uh, for the all the MQTT interactions and HTTP interactions, we have already develop the reference agent. So you can just adapt it quickly by just plugging in or gluing in that uh, that device specific protocol logic. OK, and yeah. we are trying to as you as you uh, as you asked, like we are actually trying to uh, come up with a out of the box agent where you can just probably write a single script or something like that with just focusing just on that third party protocol interaction and just plug it into the uh, into that uh, out of box child device connector. So this is another item that we have in our roadmap. Thank Brilliant. you. Excellent. Th th thanks, thanks, Alvin. So I, I'm um, 
uh, I'm, I'm aware I, the timing's time is coming to a, to an end. So, so once again, unfortunately, we've actually run out of time uh, for this um, finished IO community meetup. I'd like to thank all our presenters and demonstrators. Done an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, so I really enjoyed the um, the sessions of sitting back here and watching more of the technical dialogue. And I think it, from the comments, etc., I think you have done as well. So if you've got any questions that we haven't answered, we get back to you after the session as well. We're keen to keep your time. I would also like to make you aware that most of the contributors are actually recruiting in this space. So it, uh, please spread the word through your sort of contact networks, professional networks for anybody who may want to come on board as in, in a professional capacity. Uh, and with that, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. So stay safe. And we will see you at the next meetup. So either be uh, late February or early March. So thank you for attending. And we look forward to speaking to you next time. Thanks a lot.